Hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing really, really well. Today's video is a continuation to part one. In part one of the video, we looked at a great movement called the Bhakti movement, which started in South India. In part one, we looked at the Bhakti movement, what the Bhakti movement was about, how did it come about, who brought the Bhakti movement, why did the Bhakti movement come. So in this video, which is part two, we will be exploring who were the people responsible for the Bhakti movement. And we're going to dig in a little deeper to find out the causes to the Bhakti movement. Some saints and religious leaders questioned certain religious rituals and practices. They could see no benefit from it, and they felt they had to play a role in opening the minds of the Hindus so that they could unite. For example, the caste system. Let's look at the caste system. What is it? The caste system divides Hindus into four main categories. Brahmin, who is the priest or the learned class. Kshatriyas, who were warriors. Vaishyas, who were traders or merchants. And Shudras, unskilled workers and laborers who did menial small jobs. And these were the ones who faced the biggest curse from the caste system. They were said to be untouchables. They were considered to be dirty and their life was a life of misery. It was as if they were cursed. They lived in absolute poverty. They had no right to education. They had no right to enter any temples. If a Brahmin or a Kshatriya was accidentally touched by a Shudra, they considered themselves unclean. This fourth group of the caste system suffered the most and lived in absolute misery. So the four main castes were Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras. And these castes were again divided into 3,000 more castes and 25,000 sub-castes and each of these were based on their occupation. The caste system was also determined by birth. A Brahmin could not become a Vaishya, and neither could a Shudra become a Brahmin. One's caste was fixed by birth. If your parents were Brahmins, then you automatically become a Brahmin. One's caste could not change by marriage or karma, and neither could your condition change your caste. Let's look at who brought in the caste system? When did it come about? Well, it's said that the Aryans who came from Central Asia after they invaded India had introduced the caste system to control the local population. The caste system didn't come in right after these Aryans invaders set foot. It in fact came in 2000 years later. Historians see it as a political development, not as a religious development, because like I said, they wanted to control the local population. Ancient India at the time was made of several races. What do you mean by a race? Well, race is the physical characteristic that makes you different from another group of people. For example, Negro is a race. It's mostly the black Africans who come under this. Mongoloids are the Chinese or the Japanese race. Caucasians are the British white or the American and Australian whites. So a person's race depends on his skin color, facial features and hair type. So the idea that one race or one group of people should keep their bloodline pure by not marrying into another group was present in a small section of ancient Indians. And then later on, this idea spread to the rest of the Indian races. So one group never married into another group and this way they kept their bloodline pure. For example, Brahmins never married into Kshatriyas 
Brahmins married only Brahmins, Kshatriyas married only Kshatriyas. And having a pure bloodline became a sign of prestige, a sign of honor and great respect. So India, before the Aryans, was a group of mixed race. And it was only after the Aryans entered India that the groups and races were divided. So because of the caste system, the low caste Hindus, that is the Shudras, were tired of the caste system, which was making their life difficult and unfair. The caste system was a blessing for few and a curse for this particular class. Bhagavad Gita and the Vedas spoke about moksha or salvation as a supreme goal. And according to Bhagavad Gita, moksha is considered to be freedom or liberation in the highest form and is beyond any good or evil. Moksha was considered to be very difficult for the women, the low caste untouchables. In the Hindu philosophy, moksha means freedom from cycle of death and rebirth. If one's karma or actions are evil, then it is said the soul or Atman looks for cleansing. The Atman will complete the cycle many, many times, working on its karma till it gets moksha. So one's karma is related to one's moksha. And to unite with God, one's karma must be pure. Good karma is called punya and bad karma is called papa and only if the soul or atman has no sin will it reach moksha the bhakti saints spread the message of love compassion and mercy and this message was something that every group could connect with in the last video we listened to a beautiful bhajan called vaishno vajante so now just imagine a saint or a godly man singing this on a road crowded with people or singing it in a residential place what effect could it have on the minds and hearts of those listening to it let's again listen to a few lines and let me translate it for you <laughs> पीड़ पर जानी रे वैष्णव इज द वन हु रियलाइजेस और फील्स द पेन ऑफ द अदर पर दुखे उपकार करे तो ये मन अभिमान ना आए रे he helps those who are in misery or sad without letting pride enter his heart. Isn't it just a beautiful bhajan? Every time I listen to it, I get goosebumps. How do you feel when you listen to this bhajan? These are just a few lines from this bhajan and it already connects you with humanity. So imagine when the saints would roam around from one place to another, singing the beautiful bhajans, how it must have uplifted the people listening to it. The bhajans that were sung by the bhakti saints made a huge impact on the listeners. It helped them connect with God, which was the goal of these saints, so that man could find moksha or freedom from the world and find inner peace. One such bhakti saint was Basaveshwara of Kalyana, who declared a social revolution against the caste system and the gender-based discrimination or differences that was happening in India at the time. To achieve these ideal situations, the three Acharyas and Basaveshwara preached to people to surrender to God, no matter what the caste, faith, or no matter how rich or poor, they tried to revive or bring back the society through the Bhakti Marga. Though in South, the devotion focused on Shiv and Vishnu, 
Up in North India, it was centered on Ram and Krishna, who are considered to be incarnations of Vishnu. Some historians say that the Bhakti movement may have been a reaction through the Muslim influence, where there was this devotion and surrender to one God. Some historians also say that it may have developed through Sufi influence, which again is about devotional love to God. But all said and done, this movement gained full force and was going strong during the Middle Ages. And it is what brought about a lot of shift from old Hinduism to new Hinduism as we know it today. Let's now look at the teaching of the three Acharyas. The most leading amongst them was Adi Shankaracharya, who spread the Advaita philosophy. He was born in a village called Kaladi in Kerala to a Namudri Brahmin family. His father's name was Shivaguru and mother Aryamba. As a child, Shankaracharya was very intelligent and at age seven, he had mastered all the scriptures. He learned Vedas and Puranas from his teachers, Govinda Bhagavad Pada. Shankaracharya studied Upanishads and Brahma Sutras, and through this, he spread and taught the Advaita philosophy. At his Guru's command, Shankaracharya wrote commentaries explaining hidden meanings of the scripture, and by age 16, he completed writing it. According to the Advaita philosophy, Brahma or God is the one and only truth and everything else is absolute false. Our soul or Atman is one with Brahma, God, and we nor our life is separate from Brahma. Shankaracharya is considered to be an ideal sannyasi or saint. He traveled across India bringing to Indians the message of the Vedas. India at the time was deep in superstitions also in caste system and the essence of the Sanatan Dharma was going away. Sanatan Dharma was what Hinduism was known originally. The word Hinduism came in much later. The philosophy that Shankaracharya spread, which is Advaita, is the oldest school of Vedanta and he believed that Brahma or God is the only reality. The world, according to Shankaracharya, was an illusion, a maya, and Brahma, or God, was the absolute truth. He felt that people should realize the true nature of the world, which is to get in touch with one's God, rather than live in a dream or in a false world of imagination. And by doing this, one can attain moksha or freedom. Let's look at some of the work that was done by Shankaracharya. His hymn, Bhaja Govindam, was very famous. He traveled from Kanyakumari to Kashmir on foot to spread the Advaita philosophy and to establish the spread of his message. He established something called pitas or institutions in all directions, that is in north, south, east, west of India. It gave the Hindus a new way of thinking and a new direction. The Pitas, or Mats as it's called, were established by him, were Jyoti Pita in Badrinath in northern India, Kalika Pita in Dwarka in Gujarat in west of India, Kuvardhan Pita at Puri in Orissa, which is in eastern India, and lastly, Sharada Pita in Sringeri in Karnataka, which is south of India, and Kamakoti Pita in Kanchi in Tamil Nadu, again in South India. From this, we realized the commitment that Adi Shankaracharya had towards spreading his Advaita philosophy by looking at how the Pitas that he established were strategically placed all throughout India. The next saint or Acharya who we are going to be looking at is Ramanujacharya, who spread the Vishisht Advaita philosophy. Ramanujacharya was born in Sri Perambadur near Chennai. Keshava Somyaji was his father and Kantimati his mother. He studied Vedas and Upanishads at Yadava Prakasha 
at Kanchi, a famous learning center in South India. He completed and went to Sri Rangapatnam, where he became the head of a mutt. But the Chola ruler, who was a Shaivite or a Shiva Bhakt, was bothering Ramanujacharya. And when the Hoysala king Bittadeva found out this and invited Ramanujacharya, Ramanujacharya immediately took the offer. Later, Bittadeva himself accepted Vaishnava tradition and became Vishnuvarthan. Ramanujacharya then went to Melakot and built the Chelua Narayana temple. Ramanujacharya was keen to show the path to salvation or moksha to the common people. His philosophy is called Vishisht Advaita. And according to this philosophy, Jiva or life and Prakriti or nature are under the control of Brahma, the creator. Both Atma and Paramatma, that is God, cannot become one simultaneously or at the same time. Brahma or God has expressed himself through the world. The world, according to Ramanujacharya, is the manifestation of God. And this world, according to Ramanuja, was and is a reality. In order to achieve mukti or moksha or salvation, surrendering to God is the most important thing. And it can happen only through bhakti or true devotion and prapti or surrender. According to Ramanujacharya, Brahma, who is the creator, shows himself in many souls or in many forms. Ramanuja's philosophy is a mix of Vedas and Bhagavad Puranas. Vedas are the earliest scriptures from India. It consists of Rig Veda, Sam Veda, Yajur Veda and Atharva Veda. Bhagavad Puranas are Hindu scriptures that are respected by the Vaishnavites who consider Vishnu as their supreme god. Ramanuja Acharya was influenced by Tamil saints called Alvars. He studied many religious texts and wrote many books like Vedanta Sangraha, Vedanta Sara, Vedanta Deepika, Shribhasya, and he gave a lot of importance to the Bhakti path in his very important book, Gita Pashya. Saint Ramananda and Riyadasa who were both from North India, were greatly influenced by Ramanuja Acharya's philosophy. Aravidu and Tuluva dynasties of Vijayanagara kingdom were followers of Ramanuja Acharya's philosophies. Now we should look at Madhvacharya, who founded the Dweta philosophy. He was born in Pajaka village near Udupi in Karnataka. His father's name was Madhva Gihabhatta and mother was Vedavati. Vishnu was their family god or deity and Madhvacharya displayed abundant and a lot of knowledge from very young age. He was educated in Vedas. I explained to you that Vedas were old Indian scriptures that consisted of various other scriptures. So he was educated in the Vedas and in Upanishads. Upanishads are also old Indian scriptures that explain the Vedas. He learned it from his guru, Achyuta Praksha. The same teacher who later inducted Madhvacharya or who made Madhvacharya into a sannyasi. He gained plenty of knowledge about the religious books and he would often defeat other gurus in debates. That is how good he was in his knowledge. He was the founder of the Dvaita philosophy. In his lifetime, his followers regarded him as an incarnation of God Vayu, or the God of Wind, who was sent to earth by God Vishnu to bring about good and to destroy all evil. His philosophy called Dvaita believed that the human soul or Atman and the divine soul or Brahman were separate. Dvaita means two and so the name Dvaita because of the separation between Atman and Brahman. According to the philosophy, Jivatma or living souls are many, but Paramatma, that is God, is only one. Madhvacharya believed that every soul was different and no soul was the same. 
and when soul attains moksha and is freed, it becomes almost like God. It doesn't become God, but it becomes like God because it is still inferior to God. Madhvacharya traveled many places and he participated in debates to spread his philosophy. He got Lord Krishna's idols which was hidden in a small hill and installed it in Udupi. He established the regular worship of Lord Krishna by establishing eight mats. Madhvacharya believed that the relationship between us humans and God was that of servants and master, God being the master and we his servants. His works were Gita Bhasya and Gita Tatparya. He wrote commentaries on the Brahma Sutras. He wrote commentaries on the Upanishads. He worked on the Vedas and he also did work on Mahabharata and on the Puranas. Let's again go over the final teachings of the three saints, Adi Shankaracharya, Ramanujacharya and Madhvacharya. Shankaracharya spread the Advaita philosophy. In this philosophy, he believed that man and God were one, that this world was an illusion, and Brahma had no image, and so he did not believe in idol worship. Ramanujascharya spread the Vishishtadvaita philosophy. He believed that there was one creator, Brahman, but who showed himself in various forms or who came in various souls. And Madhvacharya spread the Dvaita philosophy, where he believed that Brahman or God and Atma, human soul, were two different things and separate, and that one can become like God only through bhakti or devotion to God. I hope you all understand and are able to tell the differences between the three philosophies. But what you need to understand especially is that though these three philosophies had some differences, they always stressed on one thing and that was that man has to surrender to God and that this could be done only through bhakti and devotion to mankind. And if one did this, one could attain moksha, which was the freedom of soul and freedom from being born again and again and again. Now we shall look at a very important and social reformer who was Pasaveshwara. He rejected many rituals and practices and he strongly opposed the caste system. He believed that all humans are one and no one is untouchable by birth. Only evil or dirty thoughts and evil behavior makes a person untouchable. People from various backgrounds were part of his philosophy, the Vachana movement. He spread social awareness through poetry called Vachanas and through this he helped people to reject gender discrimination, caste discrimination, superstitions and rituals. Bhasaveshwara and his followers had one goal, which was to create a society based on equality, where every man is equal. Bhasaveshwara came from Karnataka and he existed during the Kalyani Chalukya and Kalachuri dynasty. Bhasaveshwara was active during the rule of both the dynasties, but he reached his peak of influence during the rule of King Bijala II in Karnataka. Because of the dedication of these great saints, the followers of Bhakti movement rejected many rituals and superstitions and there was a lot of consideration for the caste system, which hadn't been removed completely, but people started questioning it. Some people even dared to mix with others on the basis of equality. The Bhakti movement was a revolution. Communities were singing bhajans together, eating from a common kitchen, and all of it helped for loosening the caste system that was so, so rigid on the Indian community and which had to fall if India had to be united. But in spite of its many, many great benefits, the Bhakti movement creates some negativity because of some people who were still very close-minded and 
who wanted to hold on to old superstitions, practices and rituals. And because of this, India remained divided. With this, we end the chapter. The next chapter will be chapter 6, which is called Bhakpant. And this chapter is in continuation to chapter 3, where we will look at other saints like Guru Nanak and explore further the impact of the Bhakti movement. Thank you so much for listening. It was really fun. We discovered so much about this great movement and we'll discover more and more as we learn on. Keep an open mind and always remember, knowledge is power. Take care. See you. Bye.